So good morning, everyone. My name is Salam Kazi, and welcome to the GOR Summit. How do I get this plane airborne? Now, you may be wondering why there's a topic about aviation over here. Well, hindsight is 2020. I should have added a subtitle. Um, but initially, I want to start this topic back in August of 2022. Uh, after two years of searching for a job, I was finally approached by Crytek uh, with a job offer. Now, in some of these instances, you, some of you may have gone and celebrated and marked the moment. But for me, it was a moment of anxiety as I quickly realized that I'm supposed to be answering to the research uh, demands of a 200 plus team. Many questions went through my head. And the biggest one that emerged was this. How do I even start? How do I even kickstart research within a game studio? And that is what today's topic is about. Today, I'll be taking you through some of, the step, some of the steps you can take in terms of prepping before you join the position. What are you exactly are you stepping into? What kind of prep work you can do? Next, who are you supposed to be talking to once you find, when you first join? What kind of conversations do you need to get started? And what you should be researching? Finally, as you start to take off, who all can you bring on to your crew what are your own personal limits, and who can help you in your process? The goal of this talk, hopefully, by the end, you should at least have an idea on what it is you can do to at least take the next step to grow your research department. So what kind of plane is it? <laughs> all good. Um, most of the tips in this section are primarily going to be around things you can do during the interview phase. Some of you might be already be doing it, so. Recording in progress. There we go. <laughs> All good. Do, we need, do I need to restart? Mm -hmm. fine. I think fine. All right. So what are the steps you can do uh, before you actually start the position? Let's begin with who am I, as the Jackie Chan once said. Know thyself. Does, now, this is a very fundamental thing that I think most people just don't look at. They immediately look for, see a position, and just start applying for it without actually taking a look at the job profile. So the first thing you can do is just seeing how does this job profile fit towards you? What are your strengths? Does it actually fit into what your, uh, what your expertise are? And then also start listing down where do you feel like you're lacking experience with this job profile? Next, list of tools. Now, this is something that was really useful for me. I started making a list from all the way from planning to debrief to delivery of a report. What all tools do I need to get the job done? From software to hardware solutions. And in this case, in this case, I also started noting down some alternative solutions. One step which could be like much more better that I personally couldn't afford previously. And some sales, uh, some platforms that are less than ideal, but might be more cheaper for you. Again, I will come to why you need to do this a little bit later. And finally, creating and consolidating some templates. Now, if you've been doing research for a while, you probably already have a report format. You probably already have research documents in there. The reason I'm telling you to start doing this right now because it saves time later on, and you're not actually doing it when you first join. A quick tip for if you're planning to share this document outside to other teams, the tip over there is do not overcomplicate it. Keep it simple, keep it safe, and keep it very easy for reading. Versus if, you're keep, if you have a lot of research documents that you're not sharing and you're, it is for you, you we want to make sure that you have optimized it to the best of your ability so it saves you time later on. So we have, little, we have learned a little bit about ourselves. Who, what exactly are you walking into? In, I know interviews are already a very stressful time. Believe me, I've been through a fair share of them before I found this position. But you want to make use of this opportunity to figure out two things. Number one, what exactly is the team you're working for? And what, what exactly the products are you working on? In terms of teams, you want to know what the team hierarchy is and what's the structure. Determine who you'll be reporting to. Figure out what the UX maturity is within the company. And then maybe later on, remember the list of tools that you created? 
You can now cross-reference those the list of tools by asking them what kind of tools do you use in your day-to-day, -day and see which ones are missing. In terms of what products uh, you'll be working on, try to figure out what the scope and the target audience is. This is regardless of whether it's a if it's a live game, a free-to-play, or if it's a game still in development. Determine what it is that the development team is trying to target. Figure out what's the development pace and methodology on how they go about their production. And finally, what kind of expectations are they, do they have for you when they ask you to, when they are recruiting you? Now, a question that comes up quite a bit the, on LinkedIn for me by some less experienced uh, researchers is that, do I need to play the game? This maybe makes more sense in a more live service, a live service game contract. But even so, maybe in uh, a franchise which has had previous installments. And in my mind, I say yes, but not in the way you're thinking. When I say yes, what I mean is you have to start learning the game as a language. Figuring out how the various systems and functions, how they relate to each other and create the overall end experience. You should also take your time to familiarize yourself with the game's nomenclature, terminology, and iconography. And also see what it, your game is doing compared to everything else, compared to the similar games. And finally, I think this is the most important point. How does this game make money? Game development is a business, as Seb Long once said. And most likely, this business is paying for your salary. Knowing, knowing what is driving the sales, what is driving success for your game will give you a lot more insight into how decisions are made and how features are prioritized. When I say play the game, you don't have to get good. No one's expecting you to be an expert. There isn't going to be an in-game tournament by the time you come in. You can always ask for people to elaborate when you are out of depth or you feel like you don't know what kind of terminology they're using. Sometimes developers have different names for the things that are there in game. So feel free to ask. You can also ask maybe outside in, separate, in a separate conversation if you're a little bit shy. And finally, don't let your lack of experience with the game make you feel scared to do interviews with more expert players. In fact, it will actually give you more insights than you think. And a quick example of this. Uh, back in 2019, I was hired by EA to be a moderator for the Madden game. Now, as someone who was born in India and who has been brought up in the Middle East, football means something completely different to me. In, uh, in, my, in my football, people actually use the foot to kick the ball. Okay? <laughs> but that being said, I had the most illuminating conversations with the expert players of Madden franchise because over there, I could actually ask them to take me through step by step on what exactly that they are facing and you would be surprised on how enthusiastic they may be to tell you about these problems. <laughs> and the last thing, uh, so you have done a little bit of research for yourself. You have done a little bit of research on who it is you're working on and what it is you're working on. Now, you remember that list of things that I told you to make in terms of strengths and weaknesses? This is where it comes in. There is a, a small franchise called Harry Potter. In it, a vaguely gay man called Dumbledore, who pretends to be the headmaster, has a, very, uh, has a line that has stuck to me. Help is always given to those who ask for it. And that is a line that can be very applicable today. All you have to do is send out a message, and you'll probably get responses really quickly. In my case, I, I started doing two things. Through the IGDA GOR resources, I started going through the previous summit talks and trying to make a playlist of what all topics I felt were more pertinent to my situation and maybe some topics that I felt uh, I needed to get a brush up on. Next, there were some templates and guides. I don't know if you know, but Steve Romney has a list of templates from uh, audio video consent forms to all the way to reports. I tried to cross check if my, if my reports or if my uh, documentation was the, really the best way to go about things or have people find a more optimized route. Next, I scheduled some one-on-one -on -one talks with some of the members. Uh, over here, I tried to make the most of their time, so I had two different approaches. In the first one, I reached out to my professor and a mentor, Dr. Adams. In, that, in those meetings I had with him, it was mainly on I presented a problem to him, I presented my solution to him, and I asked him to give me criticism. 
and basically poke all, find out all the holes. <laughs> the other way I started reaching out was for insight into foreign tools and regions. I reached out to a friend call, from EA called George Rogers. He's uh, handling the recruitment and ops, last I checked, uh, for the UK and European regions. Now, I didn't know much about what goes into recruitment in terms of an industry standard, what tools they use, uh, and what is what are the best practices over there in terms of storing recruitment data. Uh, so I went I went to George Rogers and just came, came up with a list of questions. Um, and I tried to make sure that with both of these uh, both of these times when I was uh, interviewing these people that I had at least an agenda on mind. If particularly that you you are at the point where you feel like you don't know where to start or you don't know what to do about a given problem, my suggestion is just put it up uh, put up that question online. You'll be surprised by how much literature for, uh, recommendations you'll get back from the community. How are we doing for time? You doing good? All right. Okay, so how do I switch on the engines? Um, now this is a very, um, this is a little bit of a coincidence I would say, but you'll be surprised, piggybacking off what Lainey said, you'll be surprised on how much of research is actually spent into talking with other people. Now the list of people that I bring up over here are in no particular order, but I have presented them in a way that is much more easier for you to go and it's much more natural progress. So let's go on to the first one. Boring stuff first. So when I say boring stuff first, you want to get, you want to get started on three things. Legal, finance, and IT. Three very different type of people who converse very differently. And with legal, you want to make sure that you are understanding what your legal constraints are. Basically, your age and region restrictions in terms of collecting and storing research data and in prepping like additional documents like NDA and audio video consent forms. All of this should be taken should be taken care of within the first few weeks that you have joined because it'll basically tell you how you'll be proceeding with the, your studies. I had already because I had already reached out to George Rogers, I had knew I had known that you had particularly strict GDPR laws which only allow you to store uh, uh, store recruitment data for a certain amount of time. And I also had to make sure that my all the data I have collected is in line whenever a person says, I want to be forgotten. Because that's a very important thing over there. Next, with finance. Now, with finance, there are definitely much more uh, knowledgeable people than me over here. And in my experience right now, I'm currently in these talks. They have stalled and probably because I have become busy or they have become busy. But I want you to know that these are the few things that you should be going towards them. Remember those research tools that I told you to cross-reference? No, so you have found out that, oh yeah, uh, this is a tool that they don't have. Maybe this is something we should be investing in. But in that situation, you want to make sure that that tool can be used by other teams. It's very hard to uh, give an argument just to say, hey, I want that toy which is essentially what it feels like. You want to make sure that this tool can be used by other people. And if not, you will probably have to think of a, some of the alternative solutions, maybe the more cheaper ones, to, figure, to meet your demands. Next, compensation options. Now, this, this is a very elaborate topic that hopefully will, maybe in the future, I might give a whole topic on itself. But understanding what you can compensate your participants with, what is legally right, and even figuring out with finance how they can process this. Um, again, don't have any clear answers here because conversations are still going on my end. And you don't need to worry about that. If, you, if you're worried that you cannot test with external people, there's always an internal audience. So this should be sure. Next, IT solutions. You want to make sure with IT you are setting up your testing environment within the first few weeks. Now, this may be a remote or this may be on location. The on location might may take a little bit more time and effort, but you want to make sure that you have at least gotten the best tools to make do with what you have. Next, your storage of your documents and reports. You want to make sure for your documents and reports, they are safe. They're stored in a place that is limited access that not everyone can just look into. 
With reports, it might be a little bit less, mainly because you want to make sure that you can send it out and it's always accessible. But especially for like videos and feedback collected from surveys, you want to make sure that not everyone has access to it. Whether that's you just storing it on your work, work PC or having a cloud solution that's up for you to explore. Next, what about users? So who do you think would know best about your users? Well, in my opinion, it was the stakeholders, a community management team, a consumer insights team. All these three people will have different interpretations on what their users are, what they play like, and how they, play, how they feel. You want to figure out where your audience is. And when I say where, in not in terms of geographical, but what platforms. Which platforms do your export players um, most, in, uh, most of the time interact on? versus where do your newer players have to send out their questions. And lastly, you can start thinking about uh, best and worst recruitment strategies. Where would you get the most eyes on? Where would you get the most engagement if you were to send a message out? Next, understanding player behavior. So with these three people, you want to start figuring out about your users. What do they generally play alongside your game? How do they play it? Where do they play it? Even why do they play it? All of these are very fundamental questions that you should start getting an idea on. And if no one has the answer, congratulations, you have work now. <laughs> Generative research is one of my favorite things to do. It's, I love just getting into a room and just talking to people on, and just figuring out why they play the games they play. It's actually very, it's very useful work and can pay dividends for your team, especially if you can discover different cohorts within your player base. Next, so this is another question that comes up. Suppose you, had the, you, you did the generative research, but a lot of questions, a lot of people ask themselves, do I need a research plan going into a position? And in my mind, yes, it, it doesn't hurt you, but you have to be prepared to put that aside, mainly because you have to say hello to your new best friends, your stakeholders. A lot of what Lainey said a little bit earlier is going to be a re basically recapped in this slide. Basically, if your manager hasn't done so already, you want to make sure that you are getting some one-on-one -on -one time with your main major producers. Figure out what features are there in development, what concern and questions do they have, and understanding what kind of impact you have with your work. Even with, even with uh, talking with these developers, you need to know what is the size of the features, what all teams are being collabor uh, collaborating for this one feature. If you are making changes or suggesting changes with your team, with your reports, you have to know what kind of work goes into that effort. Uh, let's see. Next. Are they already place testing? This is a question you should be asking them, because chances are they probably are. And in that situation, I know testing is a very nebulous term. So you have to figure out what do they consider testing. How are they testing it? What is the cadence? And who are they testing with? But in that situation, if you find something that's going wrong, it's not for you to say, do it my way, but more on so on improving a good habit. In a quick example I could give over here, back at Crytek for the Hunt Showdown team, they were currently working on a feature that they were doing weekly, uh, weekly playtests on. Now, in terms of what kind of tests they were, what kind of research questions that they came with, how they collected feedback, how they structured the playtests, it was pretty much flawless. I had no issues. The only concern I had was that it always brought on the same people for testing. And in that situation, I just quickly reached out to the organizer of the playtest, who, who was the lead designer, and just mentioned, hey, it seems like most of the feedback you're getting are from the same people that you're inviting. Maybe once a month, maybe twice a month, if you could. Let's see if we can get some new players and see how their feedback compares to now what is going to be your expert players, and see how to take it from there. And next. Adapting to, different, adapt, adapting to different styles. Now, all of these stakeholders are going to be interacting with you on a different basis. You'll have different kind of conversations with them. You'll have different types of way you would convey data, how you would uh, sell your reports and debrief. And again, there's no easy answer. This is achieved over time. And be prepared to be a little bit flexible. If one is using word reports versus one is using just mirror boards, you have to be a little bit more flexible in order to get the what is the best tool that can get your point across. Last is improving your discoverability. Now, 
as many people I've seen interacting with, a lot of people think that once the study is over, your job is done. And I don't believe so. First of all, in the prep process, you want to make sure you are involving your stakeholders. This allows them to get a sense of what is it you're currently working on. From survey and script creations to inviting them to sessions, you want to make sure that you are addressing their concerns at any given point. They might give you a little bit more insight. An example in my case, I was very excited to do a first play test with them, and I'd created this huge survey for them. But in their mind, they quickly came out to me and said, OK, this is really great, but for these few sections, we might not be able to pivot, or we might not be able to adjust uh, to address these comments. So in that situation, I made sure, like, OK, if, we, if we're just doing this for validation purposes and we're worried about survey fatigue, maybe we can remove it. You always want to make sure that you are listening to them, because you, because you listening to them will allow them to include you more in, your, in the work later on. With your work, you want to make sure you're driving impact. What I mean is, do not stop at debrief. After your debrief with the teams, you want to make sure that you are in check and in line with the teams on figuring out what is being done and how it is being done in terms of changes. You want to make sure you are driving talks from a research point of view, whether you can give insight on where problems might occur as an expert, or if you want to say where you want to start validating changes. And lastly, you want to make sure you are advertising yourself. As soon as, you start to, as soon as you start to do this, you will start to see that people will start to reach out and maybe ask, hey, can you help me a little bit in, in the survey? Or could you help me? I saw you did this report a little bit earlier. Could you help me do something a little bit similar? So my tip for you over here is when you're sending reports out to the team, make sure you have your contact. Make sure you know there's a way to always contact you. And when I say to the team, I don't mean just to your stakeholders. Make sure it, your reports are readable to even the smallest of uh, engineers that have worked on it. So we are now at the point where you have started this initial f first few conversations. Maybe you have done uh, one or two sessions internally. And requests may have started to, st started to rise up. So what can you do? Who can help you? Well, in terms of what exactly you're testing and how the, what is the exact intentions, you want to make sure that you're in constant uh, conversations with your stakeholders. They will probably direct you a little bit later to game designers, level designers, or feature designers for the given, th for the given project. Even your UX and UI designers, all of these people will give you the most insight on what it is they're exactly intending to have the player experience. Next, build logistics. When a session is canceled, most likely it's because of the build. It's not ready in time. In that situation, uh, you should have these three people in your back pocket. When I say back pocket, I, that's a very, let me rephrase that. You should be, you should at least have a point of contact within these three teams. In production, you want to make sure that you have a person who knows how long it takes for builds to get developed, how what is the de deployment process like, and how we can share those builds. If there's a multiplayer component, you want to make sure you are in touch with your op live ops or net ops team, where they can tell you on where, which server you'll be connecting to, what would the pings be like, what is the server capacity, how is that, uh, how is the multiplayer environment uh, constructed for the test itself, because there may be limitations. And lastly, QA. QA can give you a good, uh, good breakdown on what it is you're walking into if it's a landmine. <laughs> it will prob they will probably give you a list of issues that you can walk around or work around before you realize, oh no, the build is broken. Let's wait 10 minutes awkwardly as we try to recap and think of things to ask. And lastly, your limits. Now, this is not something I can tell all of you. This is something that you will learn from executing studies back to back. You will figure out what it is you're trying to achieve, how much time it takes you to do that, and how much it takes out of you. Whenever you, whenever you finish something, whether it was a positive study or a negative study, it doesn't matter. You want to make sure that you're debriefing with your teams to figure out if the pipeline you have in, uh, implemented is the right way. Do you need a little bit more time before the bill gets set up? Do you need a little bit more time uh, pr prior to that when you're planning? Or do you need a little bit more time when you are 
uh, going through your analysis. All of this should be taken into account as you finish a study. And finally, it's not always have to be you. You have third party research firms that you can leverage. Now, this is a question that I constantly struggled with. I first thought about saying, can I say no? Then I figured, yes, I can say no to people. But how do I say it? And in my mind, it, it, the reason why it was a struggle it was because when people come up to me and ask me questions and ask me, can they solve a research problem, it's very hard for me to say no, even though if I am 20,000 leagues under the underwater. Um, so what I tended to do is uh, was work in different, uh, say no in different gradients. And those gradients were basically, hey, uh, I see that you have asked for a study. Right now, I'm currently busy, but I can help you in finding your players. Or likewise, the other way, I see that you have gone through and made a survey. I'll just quickly go through it, just adjust, adjust some stuff, and then give it back to you. Or maybe say, hey, uh, I can help you going through the results and giving you my insights, but not much more than that. And if worse, if I cannot do any of these things, I would probably say, hey, I only have uh, 10 fingers. I can only do so much. Maybe let's uh, circle back in a couple of weeks if it's still a possibility. And if not, let's figure out in the next few months what can we do for you instead of this. And lastly, you have come to the point where you might come to a point where you feel like you can't do everything by yourself. And at that point, you might be thinking, do I need a person to help me? In this scenario, you want to first make sure you are aligning with your supervisor or your manager and figuring out, does the, OK, it's not supposed to be department goals. Uh, scratch that. You want to make sure that uh, if this is a, even a feasibility for your studio to hire someone. Next, you want to make sure you are comparing expectations on what exactly this person is going to be joining and how, it, how, uh, how they're going to help you. And finally, syncing on timelines. If you are neck deep in work right now, and if you hire someone six months down the line, is it really going to help you at this point? Um, next, you want to figure out who it is you're looking for. So do you want someone who can just take the workload off of you? Or do you want someone that can help you expedite some of the more time consuming processes? In both those scenarios or any, any, one, any other scenarios, you want to make sure you have outlined your responsibilities for them. Then figure out what kind of desirable experience you want that candidate to have. And then also list down some methodology expertise that you feel like that would be more prominent for that person. And finally, as you start looking for your, as you start looking for your next team member, you have to think, has the system that you have been kickstarting designed for another person? If the person joins tomorrow, is there documentation that can help them be onboarded? Will they be left in the dust? Even with your, even with your documentation, is it, does it allow for collaborative setup? And when, if one of you are out uh, and you have to make a decision for a project that you're both working on, how does that, how does that work? You want to start thinking about these things. You don't have to get them all right at the first day. A lot of these things will be things that you'll be thinking about for many months. But at that point, you have to sit back and think of yourself. You have come to the point where you first started doing a little bit of work so that you can learn about the game, and you can learn about the company, and you can learn about the product on how you can involve research. You did your work on talking to all the different types of, as Lainey said, it, the different types of insights that you can provide to your community with your stakeholders, with your level designers, with your UI, UI, UI artists. And you have now started to see that little by little, you're starting to get more and more requests. You're starting to get to the point where you cannot even physically do it all on your own, and you need someone else. At that point, I would just say that's pretty cool that you have actually grown the need for research within your teams. And that is all for today. Thank you, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope by the end of this, you have at least have an idea on what it is you can do in the, your first few days. Uh, but thank you, everyone, so much. This has been a great pleasure. OK, we can start around with questions. A few things. Um, if you are worried about the slides, don't worry. I will send that out. 
maybe in a couple of weeks because I want to compile a list of resources that I have used and which were helpful for me. So if in two weeks uh, I don't respond on the Discord channel, feel free to shout at me. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, let's do, if there's one question over here and then one question online, then we can go about that. Any questions? Wow. <laughs> what about online? Uh, how much time do we have? Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with mm -hmm. uh, getting off on the wrong foot and then trying to figure out how to build that trust and exchange that stars the right way. So yeah. Yeah, the, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I had an experience like that where I will, my conversations with them always felt like they were deflecting my expertise or deflecting my opinions on saying like, no, we don't need to do this. We can think about that later. And it was always, it always felt like he just didn't want to listen uh, to what I had to say. And in that situation, uh, what I tried to do was I saw, I saw like this was mainly happening happening in group meetings for those uh, projects. So I decided to sp uh, invite him to a one-on-one -on -one time and decided to see what was the issue over here, where was the m miscommunication lying? Was it just his expectations or was it just him being a little bit more realistic on what my impact could be to the project at that point? So uh, in, in that scenario, I think that's your best case on just sitting down and having a chat with them. Uh, most likely, they still won't like you by the end, but it might be a little bit more tolerable on where they're coming from and where you're coming from. You'll have a better understanding on that. Yes, Dr. Adams. <laughs> So the biggest stumbling block, um, I don't know if I can say this. <laughs> um, so when I first got hired by Crytek, um, and I went out to my producer and said, I was embedded into the UX and UI team, which was a godsend for me because I could have impact with the team from the design basis. But I went and reached out to him and said, hey, is there any other work you can uh, help me take a look? If you want me to take a look at, can you help me set up, like I mentioned, I wanted to set up some time with some producers. And the producer at the time uh, did not know that I had, I could give those services to those people. They thought that I was only here to do research for uh, the UI team. So that was a little bit fun, where I sat down and just explained to him what other services I could do. And for the most part, uh, he, he did his job pretty well. He set up some meetings for me, and I took it one slowly but slowly uh, by talking some, to some of the other developers. And in those situations, I didn't, like Lainey said, I did not come to them saying, like, this is what I could do. It was mainly listening to them on where the project is, figuring out how, like, how bad could it be or how good could it be at this point in terms of development. Even if I'm there, what exactly can I bring to the table? And it's, it's worked dividends because just a couple of weeks ago, instead of me reaching out to the person, the person reached out to me and said, hey, this is a new feature we're planning to have. Let's get you on board and see what you can do to help us test this thing. So it was great. I hope that answered your question, Adams. Anyone else? Anything online? Nope. All right. Uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, can you repeat that again? What kind of? What kind of skills do you need? Well, that will def definitely depend on the position. Um, and I can recommend a couple of talks where, uh, sorry. Can you please repeat the question? Putting, uh, 
Oh, absolutely. So uh, the people online, uh, a friend in the a friend in the audience asked, like, what kind of uh, expertise or methods could help me help him get a better job into the when people are recruiting, and in those situations, uh, what I feel like is you want to make sure how much, like I said, how much of this profile actually fits you. Do you feel like you're a little bit out of your depth, or do you feel like you're actually you actually seeing like okay, these skills I do have these skills, and in the event of like asking like what skills do I need, I can recommend a talk. I think uh, it was Lainey, Hannah, and um, I forget their name. Uh, they did a talk back in 2019 on what kind of things, what kind of tools you can start working with, and how you can start doing research by yourself so that you can get the experience. In my mind, um, if I were to hire a person, for me, experience of actually doing things, doing research, is a lot more than just having an education in them. So if you can show that in your portfolio that you have worked on certain projects, you have shown what is your thinking process, how it is your approach stakeholders, how do you actually debrief with everything, what goes on over there, that would make much more importance for me than just saying, I, I know how to do these th a few methods. Anyone else? I hope that answered your question. Anyone else? Go for it. Um, you want to figure out, likely, when if you are the first person to be hired for the UX, it's a pretty good indicator on saying that, hey, this is not, this is not uh, going well. And it's also a good, when are they hiring you? Is what part of the development stage? Is it past the ide uh, ideation and concept stage? Then it's already starting to be, feel like it's pretty late in terms of UX, and they're starting to realize they need this. Another question that you can just ask them is like, okay, what did they do right now in terms of like testing their features and how did they go about it? And you might get some different answers here and there, but that will give you at least the best outlook on how it is they're approaching in terms of playtesting, in terms of thinking about their users. Anyone else? Uh, look, I can. Yeah, yes, please, ma'am. Um, yeah, so uh, a friend in the audience mentioned that if I had any experience whether when it comes to dealing with both projects where uh, you said publisher or researchers, right? Researchers for the publishing team. Yeah, so eliciting help from publisher researchers versus just me, and how does the work get divided amongst that? And in the onset, or I would say over there, in that situation, I haven't been in too much. But in my mind, if it's a project that's going to be vast and that you need their help on, it's going to be a more collaborative effort instead of just saying, hey, this is, this is going to be just me. I'll do this, and then maybe you can vet my research process. You want to be as collaborative as, as you want because they're going to help you down the line no matter what. Um, and I would also give uh, my other piece of feedback would be also figure out what their research process is. How do they go about it so you know what you're also walking into? How do they like to send out their service? Or how do they like to get feedback and present feedback? That would give you a lot more insight on how to work better and, and much more single wavelength. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Anything? How much time do we have? 30 minutes? Jeez, I went through that fast. Go for it. Ooh, 
wish that I had known. Hmm. Uh, knowing that my producers are very different types of people and how to go about those conversations. Uh, when going through, excuse me, when going through Quartec, I had known that most of these producers were handling different things. And they had their persona or their personality were completely different. But how does that translate into their work setup and how they start tracking issues or start visualizing what they're planning to do ahead is going to be completely different. And I wish I had known a little bit of that because I could then set up my planning for my research opportunities for them and more in terms of their work methodology. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.